Aren't you glad we don't have to worry about tomorrow? Because he's already there. Sometimes we sing the song, I don't know uh, about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. And uh, yeah, I don't have to worry about tomorrow because I know he holds my hand. And uh, appreciated that song. That's a great trio. Thankful for that. <clears throat> All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, yes, I am very excited to preach what God has for us in this passage today, because, uh, is, is my microphone on? Okay. All right, we got backups. So in 1 Corinthians 15, and we've, we've been in this chapter now for a while, Paul's answering the question uh, that he's aware of in the church of Corinth about there being some that say that there is no resurrection from the dead. And so Paul writes and essentially says, wait just a minute. How, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? Because if that's your implication then that has far-reaching consequences, including if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen from the dead. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then you are hopelessly lost, and we are of all men most miserable. And then he turns to say, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of all that believe, um, and and uh, so what's interesting there is when he's talking about the first fruits, he's saying that God's made a promise that because Jesus rose from the dead, uh, that, uh, that there are those that will come after him. There will be more that rise from the dead. So uh, Christ himself became the first fruits. And then there's more that slept, he says, not believed, but slept, that are coming after. Now the sleep he's talking about is the sleep of death. But for the believer, he doesn't call it death. He calls it sleep because it's not permanent. They're going to wake up. The bodies of believers that are in the grave are going to wake up one day at a resurrection from the dead. Now, to kind of put this in its place in a, in a bigger scenario, I want you to understand that resurrection is part of God's plan of salvation. So when we talk about God's plan of salvation, a lot of time we talk about that simple gospel that we communicate to people of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that message that man as a sinner needs to receive and believe in his heart and confess with his mouth in order to know the salvation that God has provided. But actually salvation, the work of salvation that God has done and is doing is way bigger than just forgiving us for our sins. Because God created man originally with an original purpose and God's God's plan of salvation ultimately is to return man to that same original purpose where man gets to walk with and fellowship with God for all of eternity. And, and, and so that's the grand picture of God's salvation. By the way, I got saved when I was five years old, but there's more saving that God is doing and there's more saving that God has yet to do. Because when I got saved when I was five years old, that night God justified me in the eyes of God. God gave me a position in Christ Jesus that the world can't touch, that the devil can't touch, that I can't mess up. It is secure. It is steadfast. I am justified and therefore have peace with God because of what Jesus did for me. That was done. That is accomplished. In the eyes of God, I was already sanctified and set apart and made to sit in heavenly places when I got saved. However, from that night at five years old when I got saved, God has been doing a work in me to sanctify me and set me apart 
in this sin-cursed world. And God is working to set aside every believer from the world and to separate us from the world because guess what? This world is not our home. We're just passing through. We are strangers and pilgrims in this world. And God has called us to sanctification. He's called us to be different. He's called us to look different, act different, talk different. He has called us to be like his son, Jesus Christ, in this world who doesn't know Christ. And so God is saving me or doing a saving work in me in the sense of the sanctification work that is happening in my life day by day. But there's another thing that God's going to do with my salvation, and that's the one I'm most eager about. And that's called glorification. And that's still on the horizon. I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but I'm not glorified yet. I'm still in this old body of flesh. I still am corruptible. Not my spirit, not my soul. Uh, it's it's uh, saved and secure in the hands of God. But this flesh is still a corruptible flesh. It's still a mortal flesh. Uh, it still uh, is under the consequence of death. But part of salvation is for God to uh, do this thing called an exchange. God's going to exchange this body for a new one. God's going God's to allow this body to corrupt as it is. It's going to rot in the ground at some point. And I'm not trying to be irreverent or disrespectful. I'm trying to be true to the Word of God. From dust we were created and to dust we will return. Uh, that, that's just a fact of this flesh. But God has promised as part of his salvation the work of glorification. And glorification means that this body, this corruptible body goes away and gets replaced with an incorruptible body. This mortal body is done away with and I get an immortal body. This earthy body, and that's what I am, this earthy body goes away and I get a spiritual body. This earthly presence is no more and my presence will be heavenly from that time forth. That is the promise of glorification that God has given. Uh, there are so many passages about the promise of God's salvation in glorification that we don't have time to go through them all today. I'd say probably one of my favorites is Romans chapter 8, the promise of glorification that God has given to every believer. And in that passage, he calls it by a different name. He calls it adoption. Adoption doesn't happen when I call on Jesus and become his child. No, I become his child by birth when I get saved. When I put my faith in Christ, I'm born again into the family of God. God is my father. Jesus Christ, my elder brother. And, and I am a joint heir with Jesus Christ from that point. But Romans 8 talks about adoption and it defines adoption as the redemption of the body. That is that finality whereby God says, Hey, if anybody ever wondered and didn't know it, this is my child. And he declares that to be true. You know, God did the same thing with Jesus in Romans chapter 1. And, and for sake of time, you don't have to turn there, but, but allow me to read it to you. And I, I would run off quoting it, but I don't want to misquote it, so I'm going to read it to you. But in Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul writes this, "...concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh." That means by the flesh he was David's son and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. 
So when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that was God officially announcing and declaring, no matter what you believed about him before, this is my son. And he demonstrated that by his power in the resurrection over the dead. Guess what? That same power is going to be on display in my life someday. If I die today, don't you worry about me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My soul will already be with God. My spirit will already have returned to God from whence it came. And you're, you're going to have to go through the process of laying this body in the ground. But it's not going to stay there. Because part of God's plan of salvation is that all those who have believed in Jesus, whose bodies are laid in the ground, there is coming a day when they're coming out. They're coming out of caskets. They're coming out of urns. They're coming out of the sea. They're coming out of, uh, out of the ground. Uh, wherever they might have been laid to rest, they're coming back, but not with the same body that they were buried with. And last Sunday we saw that from God's word that that body goes into the ground, one body, but it comes out a completely different body. It goes in the ground corruptible, but it comes out incorruptible. It goes in the ground mortal, but it comes out immortal. It goes in one way, earthy, and it comes out spiritual. I mean, it's a different body. I got news for you. If you know Jesus as your Savior this morning, you're getting a new body. Can I tell you a little bit about your new body? It's not going to hurt. I thought I'd get a few amens about that. You, you know, the new body does not know arthritis. The, the new body doesn't know pain. The new body doesn't know disability. It doesn't know infirmity. It is a, it is a new body raised to new life in the, in the likeness of his risen body. Uh, you know, there's coming a day when, uh, uh, the, uh, when all things are said and done that there's not going to be any more crying, no more pain. The former things are all passed away. But let me tell you something, that happens with the glorification of the believer. We, we, get, we get a new body. And Paul talked about that. We looked at those verses last week. He talked about that. And he came to this conclusion in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse number 50. He said, Now this I say, brethren... That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So in other words, we've got the promise of life with God eternally, and it's not going to be in the same corruptible, sin-cursed body that we live in right now. Not only does the body go away, the sin-cursed body, but the sin nature goes away as well. The flesh is not the same after glorification. So understand this, that in God's plan of salvation, the death of our physical body is part of God's plan for renewal. Part of God's plan for salvation. Uh, look, death is hard. Death is difficult. Death, is, uh, death brings sorrow and grief. And God knew that when he told Adam and Eve in the garden that the moment, the day that they ate of that tree, they would surely die. God was aware of the grief and sorrow that would come from that. And death still brings that grief and sorrow. But remember this, Paul says that the believer sorrows, but not as those who have no hope. Because part of God's plan of salvation involves death. The death of the body. Because the death of the body is just putting a seed in the ground that will one day spring up to life everlasting. Man, that makes me excited. I mean, it's hard to get down when you realize that the worst, the worst that any of this world could do to me is kill me. And that's not that bad. 
Because my soul goes instantly to be with the Lord. And one day my body's going to reunite and it's going to be a much better body than the one I got now. So it's all good. I mean, it's all good. Are y'all with me this morning? Okay, I want to make sure you're not sleeping. Nice day. What I mean by the fact that it's part of God's plan of salvation is that we can't go be with God like this. This isn't acceptable in the presence of God. This is unholy. This is earthy. I need a heavenly body. I need a holy body. I need a spiritual body. I need a body unaffected by sin. And nobody out here, none of you have those. None of you have a body that's not affected by sin. I mean, just look at you. And that's not my words, that's from the Bible. Over in 1 Corinthians, Paul told the church at Corinth to look among themselves and recognize there's not many noble, there's not many mighty, there's just not much here. I'm nicer than Paul was though. No, the truth is, in the body that you're in right now, you can't you can't spend it, uh, you can't spend a physical presence, a physical minute in God's presence, I should say, like you are. That body's got to change, and death is part of that process of getting that body changed out. Now, that would naturally bring up another question that Paul just assumes that they have and he launches right straight forward into answering it. And here's what it is. That understanding God's entire plan of redemption involves God accomplishing things on the earth through a certain time frame. Now we're in that time frame right now. We're, we are fulfilling part of God's time frame to accomplish his plan for all the ages. And, and we will be until time is no more. And God's got everything written out. Now, Jesus said before he left that we don't know the hour nor the day. We don't know the schedule. We can't put it on our calendar when all the events of God bringing an end to sin... And creating a new heaven and new earth with righteousness. We don't know when all that's going to play, play out. But we do know this. It is going to play out. So what that means is. That right now. We are in a, we are in a period of time. That is called in the Bible a mystery. The time in which we live was not a time period that was revealed in Old Testament prophecy. Now don't get nervous. It was allowed for in Old Testament prophecy, but it wasn't spelled out. It wasn't revealed by, by revelation in, in Old Testament prophecy, but it was later revealed that there would come a time in God's revealed plan that Messiah would be cut off and after said time, there would be a break before God finished up his dealings with the nation of Israel. Now here's the reality. God still has seven more years of dealings with the nation of Israel before the rest of those prophetic events fall into place. You say, well, when, do those seven, when is God going to start those seven years? Well, we don't know the hour nor the day. We don't know the time period. But I do know this. Here's what we do know from Scripture. It's going to be a time of God's judgment upon the earth. Um, I know that some of, our, uh, some of our church members have told me uh, this year that God's put it on their heart to study the book of Revelation, read the book of Revelation, and become uh, aware of what God says about the times. And I think everybody in here knows we could read the book of Revelation a hundred times and not fully know what everything in that book means and won't until hindsight is our teacher. That, that's just a reality of prophecy. 
Even the, even the Old Testament prophets desired to look into the things that God had them write. And they, they never got to see the fulfillment of things that they wrote about. But I know this, that, that seven year time of judgment is going to be a hard time on the earth. It's going to be God pouring out his wrath towards sin upon the earth. But you know what the Bible tells me in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5 is that God has already poured out his wrath toward my sin when Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, God has already taken all judgment for your sin and there is no judgment remaining for you to go through. Here's what that means. This is what Paul tells to the church at Thessalonica, that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but unto salvation. Now, this is where things get real exciting for me. This is where my hope is in the scriptures right now because God has a plan for glorifying our bodies, making it possible for us, soul and body, to be in the presence of God for all of eternity. And part of that process is death and resurrection. But watch this. At any time, God is going to bring to pass the rest of his prophecy. And so whenever God chooses to do that on this earth, there will be at that time those that have believed in Jesus for their salvation who are still very much alive. You say, now wait a minute, how do you know that, preacher? How do you know that maybe the earth won't get to a place where there's no believers and then... God starts the tribulation. How do you know that? Well, I know that because the Bible says that Jesus would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. That tells me there will always be believers at all time in every age. There always have been since Jesus and there will be until Jesus comes again. So at such time that Jesus chooses to carry out the remainder of his, prophetic, of his prophetic revelation, there will be at that time, whenever that is, believers who are alive on the earth. Well, those believers, God's not going to leave on the earth to endure his wrath poured out towards sin. He's taking them out of here. So then we got a question. Can he take them like they are? Well, the answer is no. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. It can't work like that. Oh, I see. So God's just going to, at that moment, when God chooses to carry out the remainder of his prophetic events, God's just going to kill all the believers and then immediately raise them back up. Nope, that's not the plan either. God says that for all of those that are alive in Christ Jesus, they will instantly be changed. No death necessary. Now understand, death is part of God's plan for exchanging that body. But when God goes to fulfill the remainder of his prophetic revelation... He can take a person who's alive and change their body quicker than I snapped my fingers. Here's what Paul writes to the church at Corinth about this. He says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now a mystery is that which has not been revealed heretofore. He says, look, I'm going to give you something new. This has always been part of God's plan. But now we get to pull the curtain back and see what, what God says he's going to do. Watch this. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, you remember what he calls sleep? Death for the believer. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. 
So obviously those that have died and been laid in the grave, we know that they're going to change because he just spent time telling us how that change takes place. Like a seed going into the ground, the glory is going to be different uh, from the old body to the new body, like the glory is different in the celestial and terrestrial bodies in the heavens. So he just, he just explained all that. So we know how their body changes, but he says we shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be be changed. Some of you are going to be disappointed if I don't say it, but this is the nursery theme verse right here. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52. In a moment. Well, how long does this process take? In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. About 75 years ago, I believe it was, the General Electric Company tried to time the twinkle of an eye. And they weren't ever successfully able to fully capture how fast that is, but it's fast. In, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, he's, he's talking about two categories of people. That tells me something about Paul. This, this says a lot about Paul's mindset. Number one, Paul was expecting Jesus to come back in his day. You say, boy, boy was he wrong. When did he die, Pastor? Wasn't it like 60-something, 70 A.D., and now we're 2024? 20, he was way off. Let me ask you something. Was he? Was he wrong to expect that? No. Jesus had clearly stated that he was coming back again and that man didn't know the day or the hour, but we should be sober, we should be watchful, we should be waiting for his return. Do you know what? It's been incumbent upon every believer since Christ's ascension to be waiting and watching for Jesus' return. John even warned us. He said, look, don't get caught up in the scoffers that say that where is the promise of his, of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were. But he said, God is not slack as some men count slackness concerning his promise, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He said, look, don't get caught up in the idea that if he hasn't come by now, he's never going to come. Jesus is coming again. And when he comes again, the dead in Christ are going to rise incorruptible. And Paul said, and we shall all be changed. Paul not only expected Jesus to come in his lifetime, but he expected to be one of the number that gets changed without death. You know what? If Paul could hope for that, why can't I? Why shouldn't I? Oh, there's been so many believers over the last 20-something years at South Campbell that have lived with that hope and passed away. And you know what? Their soul is in the presence of God right now. But one day their body is going to come out of that ground where we laid them to rest. And it's going to be incorruptible. I'm telling you, Brother Clell Winnicky used to stand in this pulpit and say, I'm going in the rapture. And he didn't. He will. As a matter of fact, he will before us. He, no, he will, but not alive like he hoped to. But he wasn't wrong to hope that. It is the blessed hope of every believer. That maybe it'll be me, maybe it'll be you, that Jesus will come back and I won't have to face death, but I will be changed because the promise of glorification is not dependent upon death to be carried out by a saving God. So he says here in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
Those, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, listen to this, death is swallowed up in victory. Do you know the Bible calls death our greatest enemy? And it's our last enemy that Jesus will, be, will defeat. We saw that uh, several weeks ago in 1 Corinthians uh, 15. But you know what? Death scares so many people. And some people rightly so. Because to them it's a great unknown to them, it's, it's eternity away from God, and they have every reason to fear death. But I got, I got news for you. When I trusted Jesus as my Savior, death doesn't frighten me anymore. Oh, sometimes I get a little nervous about how I'm going to die, if I'm just being honest. I, uh, I'll just tell you right now, I don't want to live to 104. No desire whatsoever. <laughs> You know, I, 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 I don't get to choose that. I don't get to choose that. Sometimes you, you hear people having this discussion. You ever heard people having a discussion about how they would like to die? And it usually turns into, well, there's this way and this way. Which one would you choose? Okay, now how about this way over this way? And it's a morbid conversation. And I'm very content to just leave that in the hands of God. And trust him with that. Because I do know this. However it might be, God's grace is going to be sufficient. God's grace is going to be sufficient. And it's going to be over. And when it's over, it's going to be better. I know that. But, but the idea that death is swallowed up in victory. I, I mean, any... Any fear that it might have caused is not even capable of causing fear anymore. Because once I stand before my Savior in an incorruptible, immortal body, what can death do to me then? I mean, there'll be no more corruption. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more disease. There'll be no more pain. Death is swallowed up in victory. Do you know what? This passage right here, I believe, is one of the reasons why we sing so often around here, O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Because, man, I can't wait for that final victory that we have where nothing, nothing, nothing of sin or the devil of this world can ever touch me again, can ever affect me again. Why? Because death is swallowed up in a victory that was provided for me by Jesus Christ and Him alone. I'm telling you, you think I'm excited. When Paul's writing this, He's getting excited. Um, let me just read to you real quick some of the things that Paul had already faced in his earthly life. And if you want to refer to this later, you can find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But he says in verse 22, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft, I don't know exactly what that means, but wow. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, 
in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul was just simply stating the truth and he even said, I speak as a fool. In other, in other words, what he's saying is, let me just tell you a little bit about me. Paul, Paul did not ever like to talk about himself or glory in his uh, life and his, the details of his life. But when, when those things proved a point or brought glory to God, he brought them up. And in this case, he says, look, this is the kind of things that I've been through. Now, let me just tell you, you don't suffer death oft and that not affect you physically. Some of you might not know this, but when he says that, that he was beaten five times by the Jews with 40 stripes, save one. It was a common belief that 40 stripes could potentially cut a man in half. And since the Jews were under a law that they could not kill, they would save one. In other words, saving one lash back from tearing a man completely in two. And Paul said, five times they beat me like that. I'm telling you, Paul would have said, and so I don't want to get things out of line here, but Paul would have said what he suffered was nothing compared to what Jesus suffered. But nonetheless, Paul went through some things. Paul suffered some things. So when Paul writes these words, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, you know what he means. When they can't hurt me anymore. When they can't beat me anymore. When they can't threaten my life anymore. When, when, when they're not mocking me anymore. When, when, when God justifies me and the calling of my life. He says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality... Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And, and, it, and I'm not reading it, I believe, with the passion that he wrote it. Because it is the very thing that Paul probably looks forward to the most, the most is the fulfillment of the completion of God's salvation that he promised. And that salvation concludes with glorification. And Paul said, that's what I'm looking forward to. But here's why I know he's getting passionate. Because when he says death is swallowed up in victory, he can't help himself. He starts taunting death. I mean, he speaks to death directly. And he says, oh death, where is thy sting? You know what he's saying here? Right now he's saying it through words of faith, but he knows it's going to be a reality. He says, you can't hurt me anymore. There is no sting in death anymore. Do you realize how frustrating that must have been to, to uh, Paul's earthly opponents? Paul would go somewhere, he'd preach about Jesus, and some magistrate would show up and arrest him. And haul him in before some council. Say, Paul, um, you know, we could kill you, but we're going to be nice. And uh, here's what we want you to know. You're not going to preach any more in Jesus' name. Because if you do, we're going to beat you. And Paul would look at him and say, well, okay, well, let me, let me tell you what my, my, my response is to that. For me to live is Christ. So if you leave me alive... Christ is what you get. And they would say, okay, fine. 
We'll kill you. Paul would say, okay, here's my response to that. For me to die is gain. Where do you go with that? (laughs) Where do you go with, with having that kind of hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast? Uh, to, to be able to say, look, guys, you, look, world, you do what you got to do, but for me to live is Christ. And that's not going to change. Okay, well, then we'll just take your life, and then you won't be a testimony for Jesus. Okay, well, that's actually what I've been hoping for anyway, because for me to die is gain. And I'm not going to take my own life, but if you do it, hey, let's go. And I'm not making that up, because in a different part, Paul says, look... I've been thinking about this, and for, for me to depart is far better for me. <laughs> now, for me to stay is better for you, Paul said. So I'm willing to stay, but man, what I really want is to depart and be with Christ. So he, he begins to actually taunt death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? And then he says this, the sting of death is sin. But watch this, death had no more sting in Paul's life because all his sin had been paid for on the cross of Calvary. So death had no more sting. He said, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, we have the victory and only for one reason. It's because Jesus died for us, was buried, rose again, has conquered death. And now for all of those that death claimed... Jesus is going to take them back. And for those that death has a claim on, Jesus, by His spoken word, can renounce that claim and change their bodies and we can go be with the Lord. Because He says in 1 Thessalonians 4, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now what does that mean? Well, what do you mean what it means? It means, it means we're, we got this hope. But wait a minute, shouldn't that hope have a practical application in our life? If we're going to live with that kind of hope that no matter what happens in this life, we're going to get to spend eternity with Jesus, then that hope ought to find a way practically into our everyday life. And Paul tells us exactly what that looks like. He says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know how we would say this verse today? We sing it all the time. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, if I abound in the work of the Lord, doesn't He say that all those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? Yes, He does. But you know what? In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter because eternal life is promised. Glorification is promised. It's just temporal. It's just for a little while. But being in His presence is forevermore. So therefore, you be steadfast. You be unmovable, abound in His work, because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's rewards to come. God God who is a faithful God faithfully rewards those who are faithful to Him. It's in the Scripture. 
It's in the Bible. It's, it's a promise for every one of us. Paul would say it toward the end of his life, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is a crown of righteousness whom the Lord, the righteous judge, has laid up for me at that day. And, and not for me only, but unto all those that love His appearing. Love His appearing just simply mean they live with the hope that Jesus is coming back at any time and we're going to be changed and we're going to get to spend eternity in his presence I'm telling you that's my hope how could we not like John say even so come Lord Jesus there at the end of Revelation Jesus says to John surely I come quickly John said even so come Lord Jesus and I'm telling you, that's been the heart and the cry of believers for almost 2,000 years. Even so, come Lord Jesus. If you're here this morning and you're not ready for Him to come, you can be before you leave this building today. You can know Jesus as your Savior today. And you can know that when He comes again, that you're going to be with Him justified, sanctified, glorified. He does all the work of salvation. We just simply trust in Him. And He's ready, he's ready to save you today. If you will believe in your heart that Jesus died for you and rose again so that you could be forgiven and so that you could have eternal life. Let me ask for heads to be bowed, eyes to be closed. This morning we're going to have a time of response.